If you would, uh, open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13 is a uh, remarkable passage of scripture. It is uh, right in the middle of <clears throat> three chapters uh, dealing with uh, the first century spiritual gifts. And in the first century, as we well know, uh, Christ had provided uh, spiritual gifts by sending the Holy Spirit to empower the uh, apostles to impart spiritual gifts by the laying on of their hands as they went around uh, planting congregations and spreading the gospel. Uh, as those congregations were uh, planted, the apostles would lay hands on people and impart uh, spiritual gifts to them. And as the Apostle Paul is writing to Corinth concerning uh, this uh, work of the Holy Spirit to um, provide for the work of ministry, the parallel passage there would be uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, where the Apostle Paul says, And he himself, that is Christ, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And when he says that he himself gave some to be uh, these things, if you back up in that uh, passage to verse uh, 7, and, and begin reading from verse 7 down to verse 11, when it says that he himself gave some to be apostles and some uh, pastors and teachers, uh, you, you will see that the... He himself gave some to, to uh, fill these offices. He did that by the use of spiritual gifts. He uh, enabled people to, to do the work of ministry in the first century church by the use of spiritual gifts. It says there in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, for the equipping of the saints. So what was the purpose of these gifts? What was the purpose of these uh, 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 miraculous abilities that, that the Holy Spirit gave our first century brethren? Well, he says there, it was for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till Verse 13 begins with the word till. We'll talk more about the word till there uh, in just a moment. But I wanted to point out that the, the purpose for the spiritual gifts in the first century church was for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And when you come to Corinth and, and, and you begin to read the epistle to the Corinthians, the first one that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. You, you see right there in chapter 1 the problem that Paul was dealing with in the Corinthian church. As <clears throat> he, he starts out that letter talking about the kinds of divisions that, that, that were taking place there. And he says in uh, verse 10, let there be no divisions among you. Uh, but be of the same mind, of the same judgment, speaking the same things. And so we, we can well expect that throughout the remainder of this letter, the uh, Apostle Paul is going to be dealing with a congregation that was struggling with divisions in the congregation. And as we, we read through the letter, we see that they were being divided up over who baptized them. Some said they were of Paul, some said of Apollos. We know uh, from chapter 4 that he used his name and Apollos figuratively to, to uh, 
replace other people's names that were guilty of this, that were guilty of allowing their names to be used to say, I was baptized by this person, you were baptized by that person. So, so y'all are, are in that group of those who were baptized by that person. We're in this group who were baptized by this person. He says, is Christ divided? Well, of course, the answer to the question is no. Christ is not divided. And so they were being divided up over who baptized them. Then you, you, you read on, they were being divided up over social status. Even, even to the point of corrupting the Lord's Supper. And that's where that verse comes in that is so sorely uh, misused by our brethren who say that it is uh, sinful to eat in the church building. Well, you know, the church is autonomous. And if, if uh, Congregation A says, well, we choose not to eat in the building. Okay. And Congregation B says, well, we choose to use our building as a place where we uh, can come together for uh, uh, socializing together. Well, okay. Congregation A is okay. Congregation B is okay. Where does the division come up? When Congregation A looks at Congregation B and says, you are sinful for eating in the church building. And Congregation B says, well, no. Look, if y'all don't want to eat in your building, don't eat in your building. But don't tell us we can't eat in our building. See, because now you're binding where the Bible doesn't bind. And they'll go over to uh, 1 Corinthians and they'll use the passage there. When Paul is dealing with divisions that had come up in the practice of the Lord's Supper and, and the corruption of the Lord's Supper, and Paul is dealing with that, and he says, if you're hungry, eat at home. Because when we come together to take the Lord's Supper, we're not coming together for a common meal to fill our stomachs. We're coming together to remember the Lord's death, to edify our souls. And so he says, if you're hungry, eat at home. That's not what the Lord's Supper is about. It doesn't have anything at all to do with the church getting together for a meal in the same place where they worship. Do, do, do you suppose that the church got together in Philemon's house to have a meal together in Philemon's house? I bet they did. Well, they also worshiped in Philemon's house. The, the, the church at Colossae met in Philemon's house. I bet they ate there too. It doesn't have anything to do with eating in the same place where you worship. It has to do with the corruption of the Lord's Supper. And so it, it, it needs to be used in context. And they were being divided up in social status in that they were bringing their, their elaborate food into the worship service. And when it came time to take the Lord's Supper, they would say, well, look at my spread. You poor people over there, you can't have a spread like this. And they would have an elaborate feast to set themselves apart from the poor people who couldn't have an elaborate feast like that. Paul said, don't do that. You're, you're, you're uh, not taking the Lord's Supper when you do that. You're doing something else that has nothing to do with worshiping God. And so they were divided up over social status. Uh, who baptized you? Well, who baptized you? Well, how much money do you make? How much money do you make? They were divided up over those things. And then we get over to chapters 12, 13, and 14. And we see that they were being divided up and they were having uh, contentious divisions among them over what spiritual gift they had. And in chapter 12, you have the enumeration of spiritual gifts. Paul says... Here's what they are. This is what the spiritual gifts are. <clears throat> uh, 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 this is what the Holy Spirit gave. He says they all came from the same spirit. All these spiritual gifts. And he uses the illustration of a body there and how all of those spiritual gifts work, were working together for the benefit of one body. There were many members in one body. And all those spiritual gifts were supposed to be benefiting that one body. They weren't supposed to be a cause for division. They were supposed to be a cause or, or, or a, a, a resource for, for the, the health of the whole body. And so he gives the enumeration of the spiritual gifts. Then chapter 13, he gives the duration of the spiritual gifts. Uh, and, he, and he, as we'll see in just a moment, talks about the temporary nature of the spiritual gifts. They weren't permanent. They were never given to be permanent. Don't be divided up over something that was never meant to be a permanent part of the church. And then he goes to chapter 14. And in chapter 14, he gives the regulation of the spiritual gifts. How you're supposed to use them 
for the edification of the church. And why do we have those three chapters on the enumeration, the duration, and the regulation of spiritual gifts? Well, it's dealing with that same problem that he began addressing in chapter 1 of division. They were being divided up over the spiritual gifts. The tongue speakers thought that they were all something. And that those who prophesied, you mean all you can do is prophesy? Man, I can speak in tongues. I'm better than you. And Paul says, that's not right. That, 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 that division is not right in the body of Christ. It's one body. Everything working together for one body. <clears throat> And I want to focus in with this background of the purpose for this chapter. Focus in on chapter 13 where Paul talks about the, the part and the perfect. And when, when, he, when he talks about the duration of spiritual gifts, that's uh, really specifically in verses 8 through 10. Where he says there in, in chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, it's, it's, it's partial, it's, it's not complete. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But, see there's a contrast there. But, when that which is perfect, another word for perfect is complete. When that which is perfect or complete has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And how does that fit in this chapter that, you know, uh, people come over here to chapter 13 and not giving it the the place in its context that, that it should be given in, in, in the context of those three chapters dealing with spiritual gifts, the, the enumeration, the duration, the regulation of spiritual gifts, they take that out of its context and they, they say, well, this is the chapter about the way of love and they make it all about the, the way of love. And, and uh, the Apostle Paul does make love a very important principle in that chapter dealing with the duration of spiritual gifts. And why is that? Because he's, he's emphasizing the point that you all are divided up over all of these silly things. Silly things. Like who baptized you? What difference does it make who baptized you? Is Christ divided? No. You divided up over these silly things. Like how much money you make. Well, how much money did Christ make? He said he had nowhere to lay his head. The, 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 the birds of heaven have nets. He didn't even have anywhere to lay his head. How much money did Christ make? What difference does it make? Why are you being divided up over how much money you make? And what spiritual gifts you have? What difference does it make? What spiritual gifts you have? The Holy Spirit gave you the gift that you needed at the time you needed it for the work of ministry, for the cause of Christ, for the edification of the body. That's why you have that. Not for your own aggrandizement. Not for your own uh, arrogance being puffed up. Why are you so divided? It's because you don't understand love. The reason you're dividing up over who baptized you. The reason you're dividing up over how much money you make. The reason you're dividing up over what spiritual gifts you have is because you don't understand love. And that's why he has this chapter here on love. That's why the Holy Spirit put this chapter on love in this context. And it begins there in verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. See, he's, he's pointing at those spiritual gifts. And he says, let me show you where those spiritual gifts stack up in the grand scheme of things. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. But have not love. I have become sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. You know, somebody come yapping at you, and you ought to do this, and you ought to do that, and you ought not do that, and and, and you know good and well that person doesn't doesn't care about you, doesn't love you, just 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 wants to put put their thumb on your head like that. That's all they want to do. They don't love you. 
How do they sound to you? Like a bunch of noise. Just a bunch of noise. You say, that doesn't sound nice. And somebody comes to you in love, that cares about you, that wants, and you know that they want what's best for you. And they come and they express their concern over your spiritual well-being, over your spiritual condition. And they say, please, be faithful to Christ. Well, that, that, that means something, doesn't it? Because you know that person loves you. See, without love, it doesn't matter how much I speak, where you can understand me, it doesn't matter what I say. Without love, I just sound like a clanging cymbal, just like a noisy ruckus. You've got to know that I love you, that I care about you. I want you to be saved. That's why love is so important. And though I have the gift of prophecy, he's still pointing at those spiritual gifts, you people that, that, that think that you're all something because of these spiritual gifts, that they were not even from you. God gave you those. The Holy Spirit gave you those. And now you've taken those gifts and you, and you, you, you think you're all something because you have this gift or that gift. He says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. You know, there's a popular song on the radio right now, Nothing Without Love. I don't know if the writer got it from this verse or not, but that's what the verse says. Nothing without love. It doesn't matter if I can do all of these. And the Apostle Paul, as an apostle, could do all of these things. And he says, if, if, if my motivation for why I put these spiritual gifts into practice, if my motivation for why I do that is not love, it's nothing. Look what he says. Though I give my body to be burned, even if I suffer a martyr's death, if the motivation for why I would be willing to do that is not love, it profits me nothing. It profits me nothing. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed all the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Uh, me and Bill just got back from the Truth in Love Lectureship in Pulaski, Tennessee. And I love that title for the lectureship, Truth in Love. What is our motivation? For standing up for the truth. What is our motivation for spreading the truth? What is our motivation for going to people and telling people what the gospel says about their life? What is our motivation for doing that? Well, if it's not love, then we're just going to sound like a clanging symbol to them. If it's love, then it profits me something because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing for the right reason. That's the antithesis of what Paul said and it profits them because somebody that loves them is coming to them to tell them the soul-saving gospel of Christ. And then he goes on, after, after showing their, uh, how worthless their gifts are, because they don't love each other, why are you dividing up and saying, well, I'm better than you, and you're, you're, you're just the, the sole of my shoe, and pushing each other around? Why are you treating each other like that? Because you don't love each other. And without love, you're nothing. It profits you nothing. These spiritual gifts profit you nothing without love. And then he goes on to talk about the nature, the true nature of biblical love. Because I can stand here and I can talk about love all day long. And unless I give the, the true biblical nature of love, this sin-sick world hears that word love and, and replaces it with lust. Or replaces it with uh, desire. Well, that's not, that's not what Bible love is. That's not biblical love. And Paul 
defines for them in this letter what he's talking about when he says, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. Well, what's that love look like? Verse 4, love suffers long. Were they suffering long with each other? No. They were beating each other up, tossing each other around, dividing, uh, having all kinds of divisions amongst themselves. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It's not arrogant. It cares about others. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Or that it doesn't keep a record of evil is an alternate reading there. You know, thinks no evil. That doesn't mean that you never think people are going to do something wrong. Because people do stuff that's wrong. It says you don't keep a record of that. You don't, you don't take your list out and say, well, you know, you did this and you did this and you did this and you did that. You don't do that with somebody you love. With somebody you love, when, 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 when that is, is uh, 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 resolved, it's, it's wiped out. It's said and done. It's gone. Love does not keep a record of evil. is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. If, if, if we could just stop rejoicing in iniquity and, and, and not making people think that, that we're okay with what they're doing, well, that'd go a long way to showing people that we truly love them. It's, it is not the loving thing to do to just tolerate someone's error. And just accept it and say, well, you know, I, I love you anyway. That's not love. Sometimes love is hard. Sometimes love is difficult. <laughs> There's another song, love hurts. Well, yeah, it does. Especially when people you love break your heart. And you have to stand up to them and say, what you're doing is wrong. And the reason I'm willing to tell you that what you're doing is wrong is because I love you. And I don't want you to be lost. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now, what's the, what's the point here? You, you Corinthians, you're not loving each other. If you loved each other, then you wouldn't have these divisions. He says... But whether there are prophecies, that now, now he brings it back to the spiritual gifts, right? So he talked about the spiritual gifts in the first part, and then he gets to the definition of love, and then he comes back and he applies it again to the divisions over the spiritual gifts. He says, love never fails. So you have the, the, the permanence of love there. The permanence of love. But, in, in contrast to the permanence of love, he says, whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. See, love never fails, but these spiritual gifts that y'all are, are, are holding on to and, and making something out of and saying, well, look at me, I've got this spiritual gift or that spiritual gift, these things that you're holding on to and being puffed up over, they're, they're going to vanish away. Love never fails. It's permanent. But these things, they're, they're, they're just for a temporary uh, 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 period to, to serve a specific purpose in the church. And you need to have the right thinking about them so as to not be divided up over them. And so he says, continuing in verse 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now, in, in, in contrasting the part with the perfect, see, the part, the spiritual gifts, that was for the work of ministry, wasn't it? That was for the purpose of building up the church, of doing the work, because they didn't have this. They didn't have this written word there. So they needed the spiritual gifts to, to, to provide them the, the, the means they needed to do the work of ministry. Because they didn't have this written word. And comparing this back over with Ephesians chapter 4 
and verse 11. And, you know, if you, if you make little notes in the margin of your Bible, right uh, in the margin of your Bible, next to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 8 through 10, right there, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, because they are parallel. Really, Ephesians chapter 4 is parallel to all three of these chapters, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. Because it, the principles of, of those three chapters, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, are kind of encapsulated there in Ephesians chapter 4. And so you, you compare this with what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till, see that word till? I told you we'd come back to that word till. That word till is what I, I like to, to uh, term a time qualifier. That word till means that whatever it's being applied to has a specific duration of time that it will be effective or that it will be in effect and then something will happen that will uh, fulfill its purpose, if you will, or, or, or bring it to an end, bring it to a conclusion. The word till is a time qualifier. And so those who are uh, uh, claiming to have spiritual gifts today, those who are claiming that they can speak in tongues or that they can prophesy or that they, 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 they uh, receive visions from heaven or what have you, those who are claiming some direct spiritual manifestation of the Holy Spirit today in, in miraculous ways, in spiritual gifts, they don't understand what the Bible says about spiritual gifts when it says till we all come to the unity to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge see we're talking about knowledge and of the knowledge of the son of God till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a perfect man to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Well, what is it that replaces or, or uh, uh, eliminates the purpose of spiritual gifts that is perfect, that is unified, that is complete, that thoroughly equips us, I'm kind of giving away the answer now, that thoroughly equips us for every good work. What is it that we have now that they didn't have then that we can follow, that we can look at, that equips us for the work of ministry? All Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for teaching, for, for correction, for instruction, that the man of God may be perfect. You know, people say, nobody's perfect. Well, that verse says man of God can be perfect, doesn't it? It means complete. It means he has everything he needs in the inspired scriptures to do what? The work of ministry. Thoroughly furnished for every good work. See, this is that which is, in, which is perfect. This is the unity of the faith. The faith means the gospel. And this is the gospel in a unified way. We can go back and we can see the gospel and promise in the Old Testament. We can follow that seed promise all the way through to its fulfillment in Christ in the New Testament. We can see Christ dying for the church in the New Testament. The eternal purpose of Christ fulfilled in the church. So now the church's work to make known the manifold wisdom of God to the world. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. And then you come to chapter 4 and how, how he did that. Well, in the first century, he, 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 he did it by spiritual gifts until this was completed. Then when this was completed, that which is in part would be done away. I've got an outline here. I don't have time to use it. <laughs> uh, when that which is in part done away, spiritual gifts were gone. And, and so, 
you, you find people today that are clinging to that idea of spiritual gifts, and they, they don't understand, they don't realize the purpose for those spiritual gifts. I, I just heard about a situation just recently that I, I think would be a good comparison there. When we look at, at, at love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and, and we, we look at the part and the perfect, and, and how do we respond to those who are claiming spiritual gifts today? Well, we respond to them by speaking the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4 goes on in that passage. That's where that passage comes from, speaking the truth in love. How do we do that? We don't do that by renting them our building so they can come in here and practice their spiritual gifts in here and, and we take the money from them. We don't do that. We tell them, no, you don't have spiritual gifts. I know for a fact that you do not have spiritual gifts. And I'm willing to tell you that because I love you. Because, because that was what was in part. That's what was partial. And that has been done away with. That has been put away by that which is perfect. Let's follow that which is perfect. Let's be united in the love of Christ in that which is perfect. So that there be no divisions among us. We're not going to look at who baptized who. Doesn't matter who baptized them. Why are you being divided up over who baptized you? Because you don't understand love. Why are you being divided up over who, who makes how much money? Because you don't understand love. Why are you being divided up over this, this partial thing, this part thing, that, that, that is going to be done away with? When that which is perfect, when that which is complete has come, that's not even going to be, be in the church anymore. Why are you making a divisive issue out of something that's not even in the church? Because you don't have love. You don't understand love. And you can say the same thing today with all of these divisive issues that come down the, the street. You know, and some, some people say, well, well, I believe this. And somebody else says, well, I believe that. Now, please understand, there is the doctrine of Christ. And we have to, uh, as he says there in uh, chapter 1 and verse 10 of, of 1 Corinthians, he says there we have to uh, uh, speak the same thing. Uh, let me just read it. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There is the doctrine of Christ, and we have to be perfectly joined together in that. We, we cannot say, well, you believe this and I believe that. But, you know, if somebody says, well, I don't believe baptism is necessary, and I say, well, I, I believe baptism is necessary, and we can say, well, you know, we just agree to disagree. No, I can't agree to disagree. The Bible says you've got to be baptized for the remission of sins. You have to hear the Word of God and believe what it teaches about Christ and His kingdom, and believing that, repent uh, of uh, uh, your sins, and confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and, and be baptized into Christ to have your sins washed away, so that coming up out of the water grave of baptism, Christ will add you to His church. Not a man-made church. We'll add you to his church. And we can't agree to disagree on that. But now, whether or not you eat in the building, if you don't want to eat in the building, don't eat in the building. And, and, and you know, if we eat in the building, that's, that's, that's up to us. We're an autonomous congregation. We'll eat in the building. And to be divided over something like that but you don't understand love. You understand? What, what, what's more important? Where you eat or where you're going when this life is over? Together in Christ, in love, in the love of God. It may be this morning that you've not expressed your love for Christ and His kingdom by having heard the Word, believing what it teaches, and being baptized into Christ to have your sins washed away by His blood. So that coming up from the water grave of baptism, you can walk in unity together with those who understand the love of Christ. Or if having done that, you've allowed divisions to come into the body of Christ over, over things that are, are part, over things that are that are imperfect, over things that, that have no, no permanence in the church. Things that are issues today, they won't be issues in 50 years. But the church will still be the church. And so have, have, have you allowed yourself to be, to be divided up
based on things that have no bearing on the doctrine of Christ. When we have that which is perfect to guide us in the right and good way, to guide us in being, in, in what, what Paul said to Timothy, how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of the living God. Don't, 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 don't allow things that are part and partial to cause divisions in the body of Christ. It may be that you need to repent, you need to come back, to be restored to faithful service in Christ. Whatever your need is this morning, pray that you'll come and walk in and say,